church. I'm colorblind, so I had to ask Allie if I had any green on. Apparently, I don't. So, what no to do it? Hey, uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Quick quiz. Uh, what country was St. Patrick from? Ireland. Not from Ireland. He was a Brit. He was from Britain. He was actually kidnapped by the Irish, went into enslavement at the age of 16, was there for several years, escaped his captors. The, the Irish were barbarians in the in the 5th century, uh, and then was called to ministry, became a priest, and went back and evangelized the very country where he was held captive. And so for that reason, we drink a lot of green beer. <laughs> I'm not sure how those two things come together, uh, but we should celebrate St. Patrick's Day in the way that I think that we should be. And that is a celebration of, of God's word uh, changing a country. And Ireland was forever changed because of what St. Patrick did. And so uh, I'm choosing to celebrate it that way today. And so uh, if I haven't met you, my name is Kevin. Thanks for coming out. We love that you're here. Love that you're spending your St. Patrick's Day uh, with us. Uh, and just uh, real quickly, um, for those who are regular attenders here, I've got a little bit of a special thing I want to ask of you. Uh, as most of you know, that uh, here uh, at uh, in the community center, uh, we have an outreach called Wiz kids. Uh, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 kids that are part of our one-to-one -one reading and mentoring or part of what we call Unplugged, which is the fifth and sixth grade version of that, kind of a more small group. Uh, and these are families from the community. The, the children are at, at risk at some level, and they've been identified because of needs as it relates to reading literacy. Uh, and so tutors uh, meet with these kids every Tuesday for an hour throughout the school year. Uh, and uh, these are families in our community. And this year, we're going to do something a little different. This year, we really, it, it surprises me, it happens all the time, that I'll meet people from the community, people that come to this building, and they're surprised to find out there's a church that meets here. <laughs> so we've decided to try to be a little more intentional about that. And we're going to have, on April 7th, that's a Saturday, it's actually the day after the Joshua's Place 5K, April 7th is going to be Whiz Kids Sunday. We're inviting all of those Whiz Kids, their families, their tutors, are going to come in, and at the 11 o'clock service, we're going to celebrate what has been a great year of tutoring and, and, and time to spend with the family. Family. So in a lot of ways, it'll look like a regular church service. Instead of preaching that day, uh, we'll actually turn the programming over. The kids are going to do some things. We've got some folks coming from the school district. They're going to talk. But it's really about focusing on that. And then right after service, we're going to go down to the gym, have a big party, have some hot dogs and drinks and some pictures and that kind of stuff. Now, here's what I need from you. It's going to be packed, right? So what we're going to do, we're going to have two services that day. We're going to have a 9 o'clock and an 11 o'clock. What I'm asking the regular attenders to do is we're not going to have Bible study that day, but come at 9 o'clock for the nine o'clock service. It'll be a regular service. We'll do our normal. We're going to, we'll still be in the book of Mark at that point, but would love for you to come at nine and then stay through to help uh, for the 11 o'clock. So in hospitality and children's ministry, I know we're going to need a lot of help that area and then stay afterwards for the party. And so uh, I'll be talking about that for the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you've got any questions, Susan Simmendinger, who's our programs director for Joshua's Place here in the King School District is kind of organizing it. Uh, of course, you can talk with Sarah Shotwell or with uh, Ed or Lord McCauley if you want to volunteer either in the hospitality area uh, or in uh, children's ministry. And so it's kind of a special day for us. It's two weeks before Easter. We feel like it's a great time to be inviting the community in and connecting with them at a deeper level, um, but would love to ask you that are here at 11 to come at 9 that day. So if you can start planning on that, I would appreciate it. All right, well, let's get back to work. Let's get into our message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for worship. And God, I just pray that we would continue our worship this morning uh, by focusing on the message that you have for us. God, I pray that you'd bless uh, and anoint everything that I have to say. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been in the series on the book of Mark. We're now in our ninth week. We're into chapter 7. Uh, and it's a, a series where we're going through the book of Mark from chapters 1 all the way through chapter 16. And we're, we're looking at the, the, the significant passages uh, and what they have to, to teach us. And we, we've called it, Mark, the story of Jesus. But we continue to remind ourselves that this isn't a distant, far-off fantasy story. And it's not just a historical account of what actually did happen. But it's a, it's a message and a truth and a gospel that's relevant in our lives today. And so today we're going to continue on with that and we're going to, we're going to look at what was a theme in the book of Mark as Jesus began his ministry with John the Baptist at the, at the Jordan River all the way up through when he was crucified is that Jesus faced significant opposition throughout all of his ministry. And quite a bit of that opposition, maybe even most of it, came from an elite, a religious elite group that were greatly threatened by the teaching that he brought as he talked about 
about this thing that no one had ever heard of called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, we, we saw a couple weeks ago where they tried to trap Jesus because he was so bold and so audacious that he actually healed somebody on a Saturday. That he was so controversial that he would relieve somebody from a lifelong infirmary on a day that they considered was not holy or, or, or was too holy to do something like that. We saw a week after that that they actually attributed his strength and power to the devil himself. So they were making up lies about him to try to discredit the fact that he was and is God. So today, we're going to pick up on a similar theme there. These religious people not ever giving up on, what, on the threat that they saw in Jesus. And so if you've got your Bible or your Bible apps, turn with me to Mark 7. We're going to pick up there in the first verse. It's a longer passage, so I'm going to break it up here a little bit, do a little commentary in between. So stick with me, but I think we're going to see something really interesting happen here. Mark 7, verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of the disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give the hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. What you see there in a parenthetical way, Mark is, is remember his audience would have been Roman Gentiles, Gentiles that were living in Rome. And so he took great care to explain this Jewish tradition, because it certainly would have seemed odd, and, and it may not sound that odd to us us because we're all, we understand that good hygiene comes from washing hands, right? And so the first thing we do is we teach our kids, before you eat, wash your hands. That, that's not what they were talking about here. This was a ceremonial washing. It was related very closely to what Mark went on to talk about, which was their laws of kosher. So these were religious traditions that in fact were not for everyone, but they were ceremonial cleansings that were related to the Levitical law, talking about the Levites, which were the priests. And so what, they, what these men had done is they had taken something intended for one use, they would created an oral tradition out of it, and now they thought they had Jesus, they actually had him trapped in a problem that his disciples were doing something wrong. Verse 5, so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? And so what, the, what, what these religious elite are doing is coming to Jesus and once again saying, your guys are wrong because of something they're doing. And what Jesus does is takes this like he does so many times with the Pharisees and with you and I, is he takes an opportunity to teach and, and, to, and to reveal a truth here. And he says this in verse 6. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. Now, that's a really important word there. That is a bold statement. And the, and the Greek here was actually, this was actually, the emphasis here was that you're, a, you're an actor on a stage. You're pretending to be something you're not intending to be. This would have been a great offense, highly controversial to those religious people who, who counted it a, a, a high virtue to be as pious as they were. And Jesus goes on to say, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to tr human traditions. And so Jesus uses the, the teachings of the prophet, one that they would have certainly agreed with, that was Isaiah, and he, and he plays it back to them to reveal that they were the fulfillment of that prophecy, that in fact these ideas of worship that they were holding on to were really in vain, that they were actually traditions, they weren't at the heart of what God was asking for in the original law. Continue on in verse 9. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to absorb your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. And this is the, that would have been the fourth of the Ten Commandments. Jesus is quoting the, the law there. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. He actually quotes the Levitical law that says what the punishment is for breaking that command. But you say, if anyone declares that, what, that they might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God. What Jesus is talking about, Corban is actually an offering. So there were those that were taking what was intended to care for their parents. You see, the law was given not just in the Ten Commandments, 
But the law was given to all of the Hebrews at Mount Sinai because these were a people that had been in bondage and slavery for 400 years. God knew this was going to be problematic and created this guardrail, this system, these guidelines for them to interact with each other, which started and are based on the Ten Commandments, right? But also included all of these other civil codes as it relates to how they interact, how they're to care for each other, what the punishments were, were certain kinds of infractions. And as part of that law, there would have been things like honoring your father and mother and the consequences related to that. And so what Jesus is saying is that you're honoring one piece of that, but what you're doing is you're letting people that should have taken care of their parents, the money and the resources that should have gone to their parents, they're instead making an offering of it, giving it to the temple. Why is that a problem? Well, it was going to benefit the Pharisees. So if, if I have money to take care of my parents and it's my responsibility, because remember there's no social security, there's no social safety network there, and so their parents, had they not been taken care of by their children, were at risk of death or somebody else had to take care of them. The practice of Corbin that was going on at this time where people were taking that money and giving it to the temple instead and not taking care of their family. Okay? Jesus is calling out the hypocrisy of that. Then no longer let them doing it for their father and mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down and you do many things like that. Jesus is saying this is just one example. Here's one example of you turning your back on the spirit and the essence of the law to satisfy your own selfish desires. Verse 14, because he's not done. <laughs> Again, Jesus called the, to the crowd and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. Another major mic drop here. This was a big deal. The Jews and their, and their, and their observation of, the, of kosher laws that were based in the, the law that was given to Moses had a lot of dietary restrictions. What Jesus has just said to all of them is it doesn't matter what you eat. What you eat is not important, but in fact, it's other things that become more significant. Going on to verse 17, side note, small rabbit trail here. If you've got your Bible out, depending on which version you're reading, we're going to go from verse 15 to verse 17. There is no verse 16. Why is there no verse 16? You got the wrong Bible? No. There is no verse 16. This happens a couple times in the book of Mark because in the, in, 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 the, in the interpretation of Scripture, there are times when we found manuscripts, things like the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the older the manuscript, the more reliable that it is. And so if you've got the King James or the New King James or the NSASB, there is a verse 16, and that verse 16 says, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. They found other manuscripts that were actually predated that. And the assumption is that a scribe later added those verses to it. So a lot of the interpretations don't have it. Now you can see it doesn't change the essence of what's being said here. I only lay that out because I think it, it promotes and it emphasizes how critical it is for us to, as we study the Word of God, is to understand how we study the Word of God. Quick commercial for the 930 Bible study that meets here on Sunday morning. Understanding context, understanding audience, understanding intent, understanding authors Again, it doesn't change anything here, but there is a lot to this as we relate to interpretations. Now, let's go on to verse 17. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, this is Jesus, his disciples asked him about this parable. This would have been surprising to even them. Because these were all, all of the disciples were good Jewish men. They would have been observing the kosher laws. They would have limited themselves to the kind of things they, they ate. We're going to see later that it was especially a problem for, for Peter in Acts 10. Peter, who, who tended to be a little bit two-faced. There was a time when Paul actually had to confront Peter because Peter was acting one way in front of the good Jews and he would act another way in front of the Gentiles. And so Paul publicly confronted him with that and Peter actually repented because he admitted that he had had kind of a, a double standard that way. There, there was a story in Acts 10, this is after the resurrection of Jesus and as the, as the church is growing, where there's this man who is a centurion named Cornelius and Cornelius it gets visited from God and God says to him, I want you to meet this one Peter. And so Peter's on his way to meet Cornelius, not knowing it yet. He stops to eat. He falls into a trance. He falls in, and he sees a vision. And in this vision comes down a sheet. And on this sheet is every kind of food that would have been forbidden for any of any good Jew to eat. And the Lord said to Peter in that vision, in that trance, go ahead and kill and eat. And Peter said, wait a minute. Now again, I want to remind you, this is after Jesus had proclaimed this. Jesus had already claimed it as, as, as nothing is being defiled. 
This was several years later. Peter is still struggling with this idea about his diet. The Lord says, go ahead. And then, and then Peter says, Lord, I can't. I'm a good Jew. I'm paraphrasing here. And, so, and the Lord says, hey, I will determine what is clean and unclean. And out of that, Peter then knows that no longer is, are, 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 the, are the Gentiles, no longer are the Christians to be battled with these religious burdens. There was a significant thing to happen because where was he heading? To meet this Gentile, this centurion, who had become a believer, who was, it, who, who, was, who was in Rome. And actually the idea that Peter would have even gone to meet would have been to be controversial because no good Jew would enter the house of a Gentile. And what you see in the first century is this breaking down of this religious burden that's going on that was a big problem. We're, we're going to see how it actually manifests and the Apostle Paul actually dealt with it. We know that in fact he goes on to visit Cornelius, him and those that were with him. The Holy Spirit falls on this group and it serves as evidence to Peter and everybody that was traveling with them that we don't need to worry about these laws of, of, of diet anymore. That in fact salvation is not just for the Jews but also for the Gentile. And so we see this issue as a big deal. What, what, it may be a little bit distant from us today because we've not been grown, we've not grown up with those kind of traditional restrictions. It was a major deal for the good Jews at the time. Verse 17. After he left the crowd, he'd, he, he had, the disciples had asked about the parable. Are you dull? He asked. I love that translation. Don't you see that nothing that enter persons from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach. He's making a distinction between the physical and the spiritual. Remembering that when we talk about our heart, we're talking about our will. We're talking about our mind. We're talking about our desires there, not the stomach. And then out of the body. And saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is in from within a person's heart that evil thought comes. And he goes on to list those things. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from the inside and defile a person. This this was a major teaching for Jesus, one that we see reinforced in Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes. As Jesus is talking about what it means to be blessed, and he talks about what sins are, and he lists out the sins here in the book of Mark. But in Matthew, he changes what would have been just the, the adherence to the Ten Commandments, because the Ten Commandments included things like, thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery is having sex with somebody you're not married to, right? What does Jesus say about those two things? Matthew 5, 21. You've heard that it's said to people long long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister, or sister will be subject to judgment. What about adultery? Matthew 5, 27. You've heard that it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see, Jesus is not making this easier. This is not about him doing away with something just so we've got this easy way of loving him. And, I, and I, I agree that not following the fact that we can eat bacon today is a great blessing, right? <laughs> bacon is a tremendous blessing, okay? So we, we can thank this teaching for our, our willingness and ability to eat bacon. But what Jesus isn't saying is that this law never mattered. And he's not saying that this is all about you not behaving in a certain way. He's saying it's about the heart. It's about the intent. And it was Jesus himself, later on in Matthew 5, he talks about the law. And, and, and he, he settles this idea that this, this idea of, of, of the Christian faith, this idea of being born again, is about us doing anything other than continuing what had started in the Old Testament. When in Matthew 5, 17, this will be on your screen. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You see, what Jesus was doing in confronting the Pharisees was, was he was confronting their religious nature. He was confronting their oral traditions. He, he was confronting their desire to create an exclusive system that locked out anybody that could not adhere to the 612 laws that they had made up. Now, recognizing that most all of those 612 laws were based in something that in and of themselves are not bad. 
We, we can't argue that they were a bad thing. However, what these religious people had done had gone on to extend it to such a level that it had become a burden. It had become a bondage. It had become something it was never intended to be. And Jesus is saying, I'm here, some translations say, to complete it, to fulfill it. The Apostle Paul uh, talks about the, the law because I think it would be easy then to question, why was the law ever given? Why, why is it that they, why did the Lord even need this? Remember, I want to remind you that these were these were a people that had been in slavery for four hundred years. They needed direction. Somebody had made all of their decisions for them for centuries. They were not used to taking care of their parents and being obligated to take care of each other. So the law was actually a good thing. This is the, the apostle John, Paul talking in the book of Galatians, chapter three, verse twenty three. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law. Paul was a Pharisee. He understood the law better than anybody. It was his motivation under the law that caused him to kill Christians before he became one. He's an expert at the topic he's talking about right now. Locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. Paul reveals that the law's purpose was temporary. So the law was our, what? Our guardian. Our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified, remember that word, by faith. Now that this faith has come, we no longer are under a guardian. You see, Paul being an expert in the law, an expert Pharisee, one of the few Pharisees like Nicodemus who was actually able to make that springboard over, springboard over from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And what he's saying in the book of Galatia, in the book of Galatia, if you struggle, let me just give you a little com quick commercial here. If you struggle with self-righteousness, and I do, so I'm not, I'm not condemning, I'm confessing. If you struggle with a desire to, to, to navigate more towards religious tradition, more liturgy, more ritual, none of these things are necessarily bad, but if you struggle to think that those things are what bring you closer to God, I encourage you to read the book of Galatians about 25 times, okay? What was happening in the book of Galatians were these same religious people, different group, but same motivation, were trying to tell the Gentiles, hey, it's great, these were Christians, it's great that you've become Christians, but we've got some few things we need to add on to you. One of those things was circumcision. And so if you're going to be a Christian, you also have to observe the, observe the Jewish laws. So Paul was writing to the church in Galatia to confront these religious Judaizers who were creating and adding to the gospel so much of the hypocrisy that's infected the gospel is not a misinterpretation, it's an addition. And most of the time when somebody comes to me with what they believe is a, a rule, regulation, a liturgy, or a ritual that they think that we must observe other than the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which are commanded, it's generally them adding to the scripture. And, and, I, and I get it at some level, and I know many here were raised in the Catholic tradition that, that really holds tightly to rituals, and that comfort is drawn from the incantations and the prayers to saints or, or the iconic things that are holding on to. I understand it, but it's wrong. I'm not saying because what is the, the, the motivation necessarily of why you believed it was wrong, but it takes us away and it adds to the gospel. And this is a gospel of freedom that Jesus is preaching about here. And I just want to be careful. The, the Catholics don't have a corner on this. We, we Protestants have got our own version of fundamentalism. We do our own version of adding to the gospel to fit the kind of rules and regulations and things that we think would make us closer. And we're very quick to impose all of that on somebody else. And so reminding that as we read this story this is really our story and we've got to be very careful about that Paul was really clear when he opened the letter to the Galatians about this Paul was a he was passionate about this about this legalism thing legalism is using the law to to drive your behaviors rather than the the grace of Christ and he says this I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ remember that word and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Paul says once you polluted it, it's no longer the gospel. You can't say it's the gospel plus. If it's the gospel plus, it is no gospel. The gospel stands on its own. It needs no addition. It needs no religion. 
Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven should, pre should preach a gospel other than one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Has an angel from heaven ever preached a false gospel? Absolutely. Satan himself preached a false gospel. The demons that serve him preach a false gospel. They are under the curse. And for any of us that would seek to add to this gospel, we would live under that curse. We would live outside of the very thing, the very method that Paul is talking about here. And what Paul reveals here is the method of the New Testament salvation. What did he say? To live in the grace of Christ. Remember last week we talked about Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 uh, is, is, is it's telling us about how this relationship works. And Ephesians 2 says that we are, we are saved by grace through faith, not by works so that any of us would boast. Why is that important? Well, because if we were saved by any other way than faith, what is, what is faith? The, the, hope for, the hope for what we will get and the evidence of what we don't see. That's what faith is. If you, that's a paraphrase of Hebrews 11.1. 1. If we base it on anything else, then it's about my effort. It's about my performance. If it was based on intelligence, it would be about my lack or my abundance of intelligence, my good looks or lack of good looks, that, are, that the, the means of salvation is faith, and that is the great equalizer. One of, the, one of the often mistold untruths about Christianity is it's like every other religion out there. Well, I promise you it's not. One, because it's true. <laughs> But, but the, the, the distinctive of Christianity is built around salvation, and the salvation of all the other world religions are sound like this. Karma is us getting what we deserve, right? In, in Hinduism, the idea that we are reincarnating is about me performing in this life as an ant, as a dog, as a, as, a, as a slave, as a wealthy person, and that as I perform in this life, my next life will be better. So it's all, again, rules and performance based. That the adherence to Islam is about uh, about a, a peer, a, about behaving in the strict ways that the Quran would teach. Well, we have things that are similar to that in terms of what the outcomes of salvation are. But our salvation is based on one thing. The method of salvation is one thing. Grace. What is grace? God's unmerited favor. His undeserving favor. By grace, method, through faith, means. And it's that that separates Christianity from every other world religion. It is why we're different. And that does not come free. This was not just an easy idea because it looked like it was easier. Hinduism is very hard to keep up with. Despite the amount of thousands of gods you can serve, the, the idea of salvation comes in their idea about several lifetimes. Right? The, the, my ability, even under the Old Testament, the Jewish laws are really based on my discipline or my position if, if I had been taught the pharisaical or the religious laws. But Christianity is so different. And, and what I want us to, to really hang on to today is I want us to leave here with a deep theological understanding. And I know I'm going to get into dangerous territory, not because I don't believe theolo theology is important, but I believe if we're careful, we can, we can get so mired in the theological position of this, we forget the miracle of what's happening. And I'll, I just want to say this in the very beginning, and I'll, I'll try to say it five more times. Grace is a miracle. It is a beautiful gift given to us. So what does this New Testament salvation look like? Well, on the back of your bulletin, I'm going to help you do this. This is a refrigerator fill in the blank. Because at some point, the enemy, a false teacher, some guy on television is going to try to convince you otherwise. <laughs> I want to send you out here with the truth about what salvation is really built on in the New Covenant, the New Testament. The first thing, the key to salvation is firstly atonement. Atonement. What, what, what is atonement? It, it, you know, the, the, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, was, uh, it was the highest high uh, of the festivals uh, of the days for the Jewish uh, religion. And in, on this day, the high priest would, would go in and he would, he would sacrifice a bull for the sins of the nation. He would sacrifice, he would bring in two goats and he would, he would sacrifice one goat and put it on the mercy seat or on the altar in the Holy of Holies. And he would take one, another goat and he would ceremonially put the sins of the nation on that one goat. 
And carrying the sins of the nation, they would let that goat go. That's where we get the term scapegoat from. So what is atonement? Atonement means Jesus is your scapegoat. <laughs> It means that the sacrificial system that was the means of salvation in the Old Testament is once and done for all in the New Testament because Jesus finished that work. Hebrews 7, 27. Unlike the other high priest, because Jesus is not only the sacrifice, but he's also the priest that brings the sacrifice, he does not need to offer sacrifices day by day for his own sins. Well, firstly, because he never sinned. And then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. You see, the, the atonement of salvation is a finished work that was already done, get this, before you sinned. <laughs> before you committed that sin, it was atoned for in the finished work of Jesus. And that was what was so offensive to the Apostle Paul as he's writing to the church in Galatia was they were trying to make all these other things not about salva or, or about salvation, which they then re disregarded what Jesus had done. Which leads us to the second thing. The key to salvation is that we are justified. We are justified. What does justified mean? That righteousness is imparted to us. What does that mean? That we are made right. We are literally not guilty. We stand not guilty in front of him. Again in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, if we could find performance, then Christ died for nothing. That if salvation came in any other way, then what Jesus did was of no use to any of us. And again, I want to remind you that Paul's standard here was if you add anything to the gospel, it's no gospel at all. What happens in our religious traditions and our rituals and all these things we add to it, we add on to them because they don't look like they have any real harm to them. Look, I, I'm not offended by the religious spirituality and the liturgy that seems to be so, so, so popular in many ways amongst the New Age movement or a lot of young Christians and a lot of young millennials, this throwback faith as if it's any different than the faith we have. I don't think it's a bad thing unless we're using those things to replace the grace of God. Whatever recalls your memory to, to be thankful, to, to live lives of repentance, to, to live the faith that works that God has called us to is a good thing. But if you think praying that prayer any amount of times and playing with a bead as you go through it has any impact, folks, that's superstition. That's not faith. It's a very different thing. The third issue here, the third key to salvation, atonement, justification, is sanctified. Sanctified it means I die to sin. And sanctification is a, it's a really difficult theological thing to process through because discipleship is about us becoming more and more like Christ, but we are not perfect. I've not yet met one that attained that level of sinlessness, though many have claimed. Right? But the process of becoming like Jesus is a process of sanctification. So after our sins have been atoned for, after we've accepted the righteousness and the, and the, that's been imparted to us through justification, then we begin to be discipled. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What, what, what is sanctification? It's me living the life in the spirit, Romans 8. Replacing what? The, the life in the flesh. Paul talks about dying daily to this flesh. Sanctification is about God increasing and me decreasing in that place. And so at that point, do our behaviors change? Absolutely. Our behaviors change a lot. Why? Because we bear what is the fruit of the spirit. Not the goals of the spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit. Again, it's going to be in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And I can hear some of you thinking, because I'm the same way, Kevin, you've just created a system where people can just sex, drug, rock and roll all they want, right? <laughs> well, a, a, a soul in sanctification, a committed follower of Jesus, when we get to the heart and the essence of what salvation is, the outcomes will be different. Paul warns us about this in Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? So that, grace may, it's t so that grace may increase? That's tempting, right? Because Kevin, you just told me that my, my sins are, grace has covered it all. So I'm just going to keep on sinning. Woohoo! 
party. <laughs> By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? You see, I think it's okay for us to judge the fruits of the saints. And it's the very fruits that's being produced in my life that tells you my proximity to Jesus. It doesn't mean what I'm doing is unforgivable. It, but as, as it relates to, to issues of leadership, it's a very important thing for us. It's what we're, we're doing as someone would be considered being an elder or being a deacon. It, it's one of the things that in Celebrate Recovery is if someone finds sobriety, that's a great place, but, but we, we, we have a structural interference and a disruption as they would go in towards leadership around this issue of discipleship. Because because to, to, to be sober is not necessarily to be saved. <laughs> Right? And so what we're looking for is, are, is there sanctification happening? And that's going to manifest itself in people's lives other than just their sobriety. That's a great place. We, they've thrown off the confusion. They've thrown off the demonic attack. They've thrown off all of these things to start this process of sanctification. And so in Celebrate Recovery, unlike Alcoholics Anonymous, we're not just satisfied with somebody being sober. We want them to live lives of sanctification, disciples of Jesus. And what you see from the leaders that lead in this ministry is their lives look like that. They didn't stop with sobriety. They continued on and worked out their salvation. Well, I won't end this without telling you there's a great promise here. After atonement, after justified, after sanctified, we will be glorified. And I don't mean in this life. I'm not sure our egos could take it. When scripture talk about being glorified, that means resurrected with Christ. Living a glorified existence at the second coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. This is Paul. We will not die. We will all be transformed. <laughs> Explanation point. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye. When the last trumpet is blown, this is the second coming. When the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and, who, and, and we who are living will also be transformed. Folks, this is, the, this is the ultimate expression of salvation, is the glorification of the saints. And as I sit here today, as much as I'd like to think it sometimes, I am not glorified. <laughs> The Lord is sanctifying me, that, that we live in, in a time of, of the now, but, but the not yet. But what, what do I mean by that? It, it means we celebrate communion here every Sunday that we can. And in that celebration of communion, we, we, we recognize the fullness and the completeness of what Jesus did. He, he, he called the disciples to this, to this communion on, on the night before he was arrested and died. And, and we, we, we go and we remember the wafer represents the body that he sacrificially and voluntarily gave for us. The, the, the juice represents the blood that was shed for us. And we do this in remembrance of him. He asked us to do it as often as we could. Why? Because we're so easy to forget that the power is done. It's so easy for us to migrate back to a system of religion and performance. When the reality of what we're celebrating at communion every time we celebrate it is it is finished. It is done. And so in the not yet... The not yet is what we just talked about. This glorified existence. Christ comes. Satan and his demons are, they, they, they are bound for a thousand years and then finally judged. But until that, we live in this not yet. But guess what? We're not, not powerful. Excuse my double negative. We live in the power and the fullness of the kingdom because the kingdom is not coming. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. Death and sin are beat and over come now can we live in that I struggle with that that my sin still rears its ugly head my flesh my temptation is still there what I'm calling us to this morning is a remembrance that the power is already done so that we could live in that perfection not because we're perfected but because the perfection in Christ was imparted to us in his righteousness and so let's quit living like we're beat Let's quit living like we're not forgiven. Let's quit asking for forgiveness for something that he's already forgotten about. He's already forgiven you. Man, head up. If you don't know the salvation of Christ, 
if, if you're here and, 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 and all of this just seems too good to be true, you're right. It, it is undeserved. Most of all for me, it is undeserved. But that's the beautiful story that, that Christ came to tell. It's the beautiful work that he came to do. And so if you're concerned about those decisions, that past, that whatever it is, join the club. We all brought those with us to this relationship. All of it's forgivable. This righteousness, this, this sanctification, this glorification, it's given, but we have to receive. Scripture tells us we're predestined and we're chosen, but guess what? We also have to express the very free will that allows us to sin to commit our life to him. And so we've got to choose to accept it. And so that's what I'm asking all of us this morning, to accept it first for the point of salvation. And for those of us who've been following the Lord for a day or 50 years, this is an active choice we make every single day. Do we believe what we celebrate is enough? Or do we lend to the performance, our own behavior, our own lack? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray <laughs> that the, uh, the truth of Scripture that was spoken here today would penetrate our souls so deeply that the enemy would not be able to come and steal it from us. I, I pray that it would find such fertile and receptive soil in our heart that we would grow such tremendous fruit. The God, that we would walk in the power and the understanding of knowing that your grace is sufficient. That, that your, your power is made perfect in our weakness. And God, that that would, that would not bring us to a place of performance and behavior, but God, it would bring us to a place of surrender. And that Holy Spirit, in that place of surrender, that we would decrease so that you might increase, and that the fruit that you would bear would preach the gospel in and of itself. That the gospel would be known because I'm with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.